All right, everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking about TV dinners, hamburger helper, mystery casseroles, and whatever the hell that stuff was inside those jello molds. So, Chris, uh, as the show will make you do, I was actually looking through an old photo album as we were cleaning out our closet the other day. And as you can imagine, uh, I was laughing pretty hard because now that we're closing in right on our first 30 episodes of this show, many of the photos that I was looking at were, you know, exactly what you and I had been talking about, right? Everything from you know, uh, bicycles to horrible clothing to bad haircuts to just, oh my God, all the stuff we've, we've, we've gone over, um, Mm -hmm. ad nauseum (laughs) for, for however long we've been doing this. But one of the things that I saw in there was a picture of one of my grandma's famous open house events. And, Ah. uh, for those of you listening in the open house, I don't mean I'm selling my house. And so we're doing an open house so people can come over. Back in the day, uh, usually more of the older generation, right? This was mostly your grandparents, I think. They would just have this once a year event called open house. And that just meant all their friends and family members could come by and say hi. Uh, Today, we would call it a party, right? Or a barbecue or something. But back then, that's what they called it. Yeah. (laughs) And um, I was looking at the photos of the food. You might be wondering, well, Jeff, how could you be doing that? Surely it was just a bunch of people standing around. No. Uh, Even back then, you guys, uh, photographing your food was very popular, right? We talked about the bad photography techniques that, you know, normally took place back in the 70s and 80s. And for whatever reason, you always had that person in the family that was obsessed with taking pictures of plates of food normally normally half-eaten food in the most unappetizing state it could possibly get in. Hey, Dad, was there really a reason why you wanted to take a picture of a, 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 a steak, you know, with juice dripping off the side of the plate onto the tablecloth and a big glop of mashed potatoes on top of it? Did you really think that later on generations would revel in that, that, fo- that photography, that choice there? Um, anyway, I'm looking, Chris, at this table, right? And it's got, you know, beautiful tablecloth, you know, antique table, uh, spare no expense to impress the friends that are coming over for the open house. And some of the food looked really good, but a lot of it was stuff, Chris, that to this day makes me cringe. But back then it was so popular. And I'm, of course, going to open up this conversation with the jello mold. Oh, my Lord. And the one that I saw in the picture, uh, it looked hideous it was a guacamole uh colored you know pastelly green slimy goop with mystery objects in it some chris actually poking out of it thank you and that was something that you were expected to just dig right in and not ask any questions and shove that goo down your throat do you remember the jello molds being just extra prevalent with your mom i remember the jello molds and and i think also if you were lucky, I remember what was contained within the jello mold. And if you were lucky, you saw something that may be recognizable like a marshmallow. It's like, okay, right. I think that's a marshmallow. The rest of that crap, I have no idea. Right. And so, yes, I'm going to do. And I think the funny thing is, like, if I recall correctly, there was a, it didn't look like it, but there was a certain amount of preparation for to make jello. I think you had to, like, heat, you might even have to, like, boil the water and put it on the pan, like, on the stove. Right. Uh-huh. And then you put it in and they had to stir it up and it's just like pure sugar, you know. And then these molds, yeah, just made for these specific things, things like jello. And then, yeah, throwing, I don't know, marshmallows or raisins or whatever you would think, what maybe whatever they had in the cabinet. Right. And it was a ton of effort for like a really poor payoff. Right. Because it didn't. If it tasted like anything, because often it would just be the texture. It's like, there's really no flavor to this. I think this is cherry, 
but it's kind it's not it's like red dye number nine or something like that yeah and yeah and anything you put within that jello lost all of its flavor and lost all of its individual texture so you may have been actually chewing something that wasn't even supposed to be there maybe the pan wasn't clear clean enough when they started <laughs> using it but, exactly but it was an enormous effort for a really poor payoff because it wasn't even like okay yes it's, it's this gesture of here's my jello mold and at the same time, it's like, oh man, I am starving. I'm hungry. Yeah, I'm gonna have some Jello. And it's not like it did anything to satiate your hunger. Five oh. minutes later, it's like, oh, are you? No. You want something else? Oh, I'm full. I had some Jello. Like I had the equivalent of solidified air that was like had a little that was like a kind of shiny and kind of gooey, but it had. I'm sure it had no nutritional value. No. And it had no just food value. It was no. like, it was, it was literally, it was like a napkin ring or something like a, something on a plate in the sense of like, well, it's just, it's just an appendage. It's a plate. It's like, it's nothing is going to, that, that doesn't do me any good to have it, that. It's a, it's the gelatinous up. equivalent of kale. You're not supposed to actually yeah. eat it. You know, it just, it was just meant to look pretty, but, and, and people would really kind of compete with each other. Well, my God, did you see what, uh, what, what, uh, Eva? put in her jello and you're just looking in there going what in god's name is that i see you know bits and chunks of fruit uh like you said uh, i think that's maybe coconut floating around in there god hopefully that is coconut and not you know just stray toenail clippings i, I what is that in there and then you know the other challenge was what 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 color that doesn't occur in nature can you make this thing glow with right? And uh, bright green and blue. And oh God, the worst though, Chris, was the opposite. The, the people that went minimalistic and they had transparent jello. Right. What? What was? The, oh my God. It was so horrible. It, it just, it, it just was the most unappetizing thing. And to your point, you could eat an entire jello mold and not feel like you've eaten anything at all, right? It, did, right, it had right. no nutritional value and certainly did not fill you up. Am I eating cellophane here? You know, but I mean, I think right. those were the, and, and these open houses, yes, that our grandparents would have. And these, like I said, these parties that most normal people will call it, or maybe they called it a potluck, right? Because everybody brought something over what in a pot, but they would, they march into the homes carrying these like, like a gift, right? And I don't yeah, want to denigrate out. anybody because they get, there, there was a lot of effort and it was the culture and it was the time, but it was like, in retrospect, Again, in these big glass Pyrex or Corningware dishes, oh, right? Yeah, everybody yeah, remembers the yeah. Corningware. Everybody had that white, uh, those white ceramic dishes with a little blue flowers on it. But at the yeah. same time, but if it wasn't a Jello mold, maybe it was a casserole. Now, maybe after all this time, I should have looked up what does casserole actually mean. What is the definition? But uh, it was literally it, to me, it was like pull out all the shit in your refrigerator and let's whip it up into one of these trays and cook it and or bake it. And all I know about the casserole is no matter what was in it, the surface always looked the same. It was kind of burnt, kind of crispy, kind of brown. You couldn't tell what was in it. Was it a tuna casserole? Was it a chicken casserole? Was it a green bean casserole? It was a fucking casserole. And it was, and of course the, the casserole, uh, engineer was usually never around, so you couldn't even ask. So I'm going to be the equivalent of like going in the treasure box and pulling something out. I'm going to I'm going to stick my fork into this thing and see. I'll cut off a little square. And as a kid, right, we, we always had to force shit. Down. It's like your parents like, just eat it. It's okay. It's good. You'll enjoy it. And you're like, no, I don't want to eat this. Right? I don't. Yeah. But there was an obligation to eat it. There was a sort of point where it's just like, if you don't, you're going you're to be insulting your grandma or your grandma's neighbor or the, or the, your neighbor down the street. And it was like, all right, I'm going to cut a piece of this casserole and hope for the best. Yeah. Right. Because you couldn't tell what it was by looking at it. You, you nailed it, man. The, the surface of the casserole was going to usually be of no help. It usually no. looked absolutely to your point. It looked like what I imagine Pompeii looked like right after the volcano eruption. It was just rivers of cheese uh, swirling with uh, pools of sauce and God knows what's under there. And I love that fact that, you know, you and I had the same experience. You would as a kid 
know that you have to eat it. You're at this polite event or whatever it is, and you cut it open. And now you're trying to almost like, you know, you're you're trying to be, you know, uh, Quincy, uh, you know, the Jack Klugman character, right? Where you're nice trying book. to the friend. Thank you. You're, you're, you're trying to do the forensics on it to go, what is that? Because God damn it, if that's broccoli, so help me, God. Did they try to squeeze broccoli in there? Um, but yeah, the, 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 the casserole was really just a hodgepodge, Chris, to your excellent point of probably whatever was left over um, in, in, in the kitchen there. Um, and, and many, many times it had the most common staple of all time, right? The one that every uh, 70s and 80s kitchen had to have, which was ground beef. My effing God hamburger was a staple of cooking back then, way more than it is today, in my opinion. Hamburger was everything, right? I mean, Chris, name a few things you can even think off the top of your head, which are hamburger recipes that you had to have three or four times a week as a kid. Well, first of all, there was hamburgers. There was meatloaf, okay? There were meatballs. Right. But then all these offshoots of, of hamburger, uh, maybe you throw, you could make tacos. Okay. Or the equivalent or that generation's equivalent of, of, of tacos. Um, let me see. What else could you make with hamburger? Well, if you had hamburger helper, okay, there you go, which, which in a sense was, well, hey, get some hamburger and we'll take care of the rest. Now, the helper, again, what was in the helper? We didn't read labels back then. There was no nutritional requirements. It hadn't had to tell you about ingredients or calorie count or fat content or anything like that. I think they were probably listed on there, but nobody ever read them. So again, you're kind of going on faith. You had a little packet. Maybe there was some kind of some spices of some sort. I don't know. Some sort of seasoning. You put that in a bowl. Hamburger helper. Guess what, kids? What's for dinner? It's like, well, it's, it's, it's hamburger helper, right? Maybe all these offshoots and then to the point of like the hamburger helper, because then you would make, you could make, I don't know, all the things you can make hamburgers. You can make sloppy joes, right? What is in a sloppy joe? Ooh, yeah, yeah. But again, you take some beef, maybe you take some hamburger, some hamburger. And again, the hamburger back then was not grass fed. It wasn't organic. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't free range. It wasn't any of those things. And it wasn't you know, like maybe 90% lean and 10%, whatever. So it was all the things that contributed to to the, the myriad of health people problems that people had in the, you know, 50-year-old people looking like 70-year-old people in the 80s. Al Lewis. So, but, but yeah, exactly. you know, Wilfred Brimley. But those things to the point of like, all you just, Jeff, start with some hamburger. You got some hamburger helper? You got some buns? You know, you got some bread? You got something and you were off. Right. And again, this is what and, and you're at school and you're a little league practice and you're whatever. And this is what you come home to. Um, you're 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 going to eat it. You didn't have nobody had any food allergies. Nobody had celiac disease. Nobody was gluten free. Nobody was any of those things to the point of like, OK, so we're all just kind of and I'm not saying those things didn't exist, but they just weren't diagnosed. So everybody just ate that. And. You know, and maybe maybe it was in a pan with some some chopped up corn and carrots, or yeah. again maybe it was wrapped in what passed for a tortilla back then, or on yeah. a bun. But well, that's a whole right. different subject. Yeah, the tortilla. Yeah, we'll get into that. Right, hamburger, and you're off. You know, yeah. spam, and you were off. Did you ever have spam? I never did back then, but I have to say I do have a new appreciation for it. It's nothing that I would normally buy. I don't go actively seeking out spam, but you know, later on, you know, traveling and going to Hawaii, for instance, where spam is a, you know, a staple. I mean, it's a big thing and tried it almost just as a joke and realized, oh, this actually tastes good. It's delicious. I love it. Spiced ham. There's nothing wrong with it at all, for God's sake. It, you know, I mean, you can imagine as a kid when you see it come out of its tin and it has a giant, again, back to gelatinous, a giant gelatinous layer of goo that is somehow part of the spam experience when you used to unfurl it from its, you know, metal tomb back in the day. Do you remember that? It had this like super gross, Absolutely. fatty, clear, right. just, ah. um, but God, it actually tastes really good. I, I, I admit. Yeah. I, you, I've, I've been turned on spam. It's pretty good. You know, 
the and yes, you can go to Hawaii and you can man spam. There are lots of spam recipes. I think there was like a when I last time I was in Hawaii, I think there was a spam like I want to say there was a spam restaurant, like a spam like uh, you know fast food place, yeah. um, or that was their specialty anyway. And right. the problem I had with things like spam, or the problem I had with these, I guess maybe the foods that come off the shelf, as opposed to the foods that come out of like the refrigerator. You know, and I'm not talking about pasta or something like that or jar, you know, in a jar, but something that's like a meat kind of product or even like Velveeta cheese. And, you know, again, I worked and it's well documented. I worked in a supermarket and every once in a while, someone would ask, hey, where's your Velveeta cheese? And be like, yeah, that's on aisle eight. And they would stop and go, isn't it with the other cheeses? And then I'd be like, I'm sorry. Did you think it was a cheese? Right. <laughs> it's not a cheese. I hate to burst your bubble after all this time. And in fact, it's right next to the lard. Which is definitely not a cheese, okay. Right. Um, but all the but the thing is, but there were also cheeses that were not cheeses, right? There was cheese food. The the craft singles, the craft and the little you know, little cellophane, and it's like that's not very cheesy, okay. You may think you're eating cheese and you're not eating cheese, right? All of those things that you you think you were eating, but but yeah. those, you know, a lot of the things with whether it was Hawaiian Punch or a High C. Or Sunny Delight, and what was their advertising hook? Do you remember what they would always say about these juices? These yeah, quote well, juices. Well, and 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 even even uh, Chris, I know what you're going to say, and even recently with things like Juicy Juice, right? Mm -hmm. um, they would the claim is so carefully worded for legalese, which is made with real juice. But that right. doesn't mean that there has to be 99% real juice. You can have a particulate of real juice in there and then technically right. make the claim that it's made with real juice. Yeah, sure. That's one right. of the ingredients. The other right. ingredients came from Chernobyl, but actually have, you know, pretty delicious qualities. So that's what we use, you know? Right. And uh, that, yeah. That's how we got around. But again, at the time, so those ones, but see, they, they, they put that out front and they flipped it, just what you were referring to, probably to, you know, to, and, and this is what they had to get around eventually made with real juice when they realized that saying something 10% juice, we're going, okay, I got 10% juice. That's great. That means it's 90% something not else. juice. Yeah. Right. Juice like. And, yeah. Right. Juice like. It looks, it's sweet. It tastes like a juice. It looks like a juice. It's even packaged like a juice. And guess what, kids? It, it, but when we bought it, we were into it. And even our parents were like, yeah, it's good enough. It's 10% juice. And yeah. juice. You know, and I think all of those things, there was a bit of a con, you know, that was perpetrated on because of that, because of the foods, the way they were prepared, the way they were, you know, and again, it's progress. It's all the regulations. It's the FDA. It's all of those sort of things. Yeah. But in regard to like, like I said, the food that wasn't refrigerated, like a, like a Hunt's snack pack. Do you remember those? Oh, Hunt's. Oh yeah. That was those huge. Those were putting in like a little pop top, like, like you're opening a can of soda. Yeah. And it was about, and unfortunately, it was like about the size and even the texture is like cat food. I think it was even the same container. They just slapped another label on it. Or of course, the contents were different, I hope. Um, so again, the non-refrigerated food foods to me yeah. were it just, and they, they were just pushed on us to no end, like a spam. Chris, you you just uh, made me remember that. That's right. The hunt, uh, hunts, excuse me, the hunts uh, uh, pudding. Uh, treat mm -hmm. it did it came in a tin with a pop mm -hmm. top uh, an aluminum pop top that was not unlike opening up a can of purina for your cat right i mean that was the same kind of a container wasn't it exactly yeah exactly what i said it was it was yeah oh yeah and i'm so you're, you're absolutely correct and i love it because it had all the same sharp edges it was just brutally dangerous if you were to accidentally touch it to your tongue or God forbid, brush it up against your fingers. You were going right. to get the gnarliest paper cut of all time. And and by the way, total sidetrack here. We never brought this up, but how many people would you estimate? And we'll never know. Died from the era of the pop top, where every can of soda had a pop top, but instead of it being the modern version that came around, I think in the late seventies, early eighties, where mm -hmm. The actual um, lever that opened the the can went down and back up, right? Yeah. Back in the old days, you would pull the whole thing off, and then what would everybody do, Chris? They would stick it in the soda, 
hey, I don't, I don't, I don't want to throw this away anywhere. I'll just put it back in the soda. And then, of course, what did they do? They would drink it, swallow it, choke to death, and then everyone else would move on with their lives, right? I think it was even in an episode of uh, Emergency with mm-hmm. uh, our, our, good, our good buddies, the EMTs, uh, Ronnie Gage and Roy DeSoto. John, Thank you. Uh, Johnny Gage. Nice pull. Half, Johnny Gage. Oh, man. Pull. Chris. Oh, Chris. You get, you, get the full, you get the full pull points on that. Uh, Randolph Mantooth and yeah. Kevin Ty, if we want to go by. You, know, you so. son of a bitch. All right. Thank you, you get very the much. Full, full points for that, man. I tried I that like pull a, from you. I oh, it my Lord. You pulled my pull. Um, <laughs> gr- gross. Uh, so, um, well done, sir. Uh, yeah. And so... I think we're seeing a theme here though, right? Which was, uh, number one, uh, food. Yeah. It wasn't very healthy. Uh, number two, I love what you said about gluten and celiac and all those other things. It's really funny today when you hear people go, that's interesting that nobody seemed to have a problem with gluten back in the day. And now all of a sudden everyone does no dumb shits. People had problems with gluten they just didn't know that it was gluten, right? Nobody had figured that out, right? It's just, no. it, it was still no. a problem. It had nothing right. to do with whether or not people had the problem. They did have the problem. They just, it went undiagnosed, but I always think that's very funny. Um, but yeah, uh, the simplest staples were what we used all the time. Fake cheese, because it was creamier and more delicious. And, and by the way, Chris, I mean, there are giant sections of the United States to this day where if you want to try to use any kind of a fancy real cheese on macaroni, uh, mm-hmm. right, you're high. It has to be Velveeta, right? right? I mean, it's just that is the way things are done. And uh, in general, hamburger was the big thing. But what else? Rice. Rice was right. the other big thing, right? That the cheapest food staple you can possibly buy. And of course, who came along, Chris, to help us with that? That was rice aroni. The San Francisco go. tree. Because when I think of San Francisco, I definitely think of rice. Okay. Right. I exactly. don't think of where it comes from. I don't think of, are there a lot of rice patties in the Bay Area? Do they grow? I mean, I know they make wine and they have vineyards. Tell me about all the, all the rice that comes out of San Francisco. Between you and I, Chris, there could be a giant rice uh, industry in San Francisco that I'm unaware of. But no, last I checked, uh, they don't have giant rice paddy fields in San Francisco, no. Right. So I mean that, but and and I don't know was, unless that was just a a, a veiled uh, inference to uh, to to Chinatown. But rice aroni, you're right. Rice aroni, the absolute equivalent of of what of hamburger hamburger helper. It's yeah. like oh shit, what am I going to make for the kids tonight? I don't have any hamburger, but I've got rice. Do I have rice aroni? Which now, I'm guessing we could make our own rice aroni because you make rice and it's like I'm going to make Spanish rice, right? Or I'm going to make a basmati rice, or I'm going to. So you can make that, and I don't think these rice could. But again, it was like here, just whip open, you know, make your rice, uh, rip open your packet, dump it in, follow instructions, simmer low, you know, whatever, and there was your meal. Okay, yeah. and we didn't argue it. We didn't think what the hell is in it. I mean, mm. I think from my standpoint, it was better than a casserole. It was better than a jello mold. You yeah. know, it was better than some of those things you may have seen at one of these open houses. But again, looking back on it, and maybe now we're just easier because we can cook stuff that's actually a little bit more like because of microwaves and because of, you can go to Trader Joe's and find just about anything that you can microwave this, you can throw it in a pan. You know, you can make broccoli beef or you could make anything that, you know, you wanted to make in that regard um, that we couldn't really do back then because no. like you know, a frozen pizza back then was pure hell. Oh, my God. OK, these frozen pizzas were just it's like, you know what? I'm not that hungry. Well, hold on. Let's talk about that for one second. Yeah. Frozen pizzas back in the 70s and 80s. Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that Italy is is even talking to us to this day that is just an abomination right the frozen pizzas that you could get back in the 70s just an ice brick that is suggestive of dough and sauce uh it's pizza like would be the best thing that they could ever put on that damn label oh my atrocious and by the way you know i hate to say it but 
even when you went to our favorite locations like Straw Hat and Shakey's and Square Pan and Pizza Hut. I don't know, maybe Pizza Hut and Square Pan are a little bit better, but in general, man, we we had a lot to learn over the years about the making of pizza and what tastes good and what doesn't, right? Holy shit, was that a bad attempt? Well, you know, I like to think that a Shakey's or a Straw Hat was for a birthday party or after a Little League game or something like yeah. that. But yeah. you, you generally didn't see a family of four eating at Shakey's. If you did, you're like, oh, man, you couldn't do any better than this, right? Because it, <laughs> the, the pizza was like so bad. And but you were maybe you were watching Laurel and Hardy or right, the March Brothers or the Three Stooges or whatever they had. You, you were definitely, I think the Chuck E. Cheese was kind of a moderate equivalent because nobody really went there for the pizza, they went for everything else. But it was so bad, you're right. And so, Pizza Hut, Pizza, you know, Square Pan Pizza, which we knew that had a short but legendary life in, in our, you know, adolescence. Um, yeah. so again, pizza to me, but the, for the frozen ones were awful it was just like oh can i have a or maybe i'll just have a sandwich right or maybe i could i have a tv dinner and i think again we know we touched on tv dinners once before but just in passing but the tv dinner was that was kind of cool and i can even remember going out and if i was at the store and i got to maybe pick out my own tv dinner right so you got to pick whatever it had in it and it may have had a little, and, and you were looking at the one, the one that best one had the best dessert, maybe it had a little brownie or something like that as well. Oh, yeah. Think about that for a second. So it had those compartments and you had yeah. the main dish, which may have been like chicken or some sort of quote unquote beef. And then it had like a vegetable, like a corn. And then it had some sort of starch, like a rice or a potato. And then it had like the, yes, a brownie or a cookie. But think about that. Think about all this, this foods, different types of foods. And the whole idea was that, but they're all in this tray and they're all cooked at the same temperature for the same time, which when you yeah. look at it, go, wait a minute, because you don't make brownies and chicken. You know what I mean? It's like, no, but no. somehow this worked or at least yeah. worked in regard. And I can remember, I don't know if you had that going out. It's like, my parents are going out. So I get a TV dinner. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was, but again, if I had picked out that TV dinner, Swanson's. Right. I can't remember yeah. anybody else who had a TV. Maybe it was Swan. I'm sure there were different ones. I think they might they, even still exist. They may but, have had the monopoly on TV dinners back in yes, the day. Yes, they may Swanson, have. Whoever that yeah. Swanson guy was. Yeah. Um, but that was the thing, right? The TV dinner was pretty sweet. And, you know, again, that was, but it cooked us at 350 for, for 25 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it was. And, you know, that was, that was your thing. Here, here's what it here's what it really was, you know, um, this idea, like you said, Chris, perfect, a TV dinner, the idea that all of those different types of dishes should all be shoved in a microwave for a few minutes and somehow become a gourmet meal was ludicrous. And most of the TV dinners were really frozen blocks of, you know, uh, paleolithic ice that came out of the freezer that always tasted watery and sloshy and gross and watered down. And don't even start me on the Salisbury steak TV dinner, which by the way, Salisbury steak, just a really fancy way of saying, ladies and gentlemen, back to hamburger, right? It's always this buildup of hamburger and ground beef as being more than it was. I'm shocked that we didn't have ground beef lobster. You know, I, 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 I'm, right. I'm blown away. That didn't try to make that connection, but the TV dinner was such a great example of we're almost there people. Guess what? In the future, right? Somewhere uh, later on in the in the two thousands, you know, somewhere around two thousand fourteen. When or we 15, have space stations, we're actually right. Wait, oh, space stations. We're actually going to realize that it's not too hard to get this buy healthy ingredients and actually make a proper meal. But back in the seventies and eighties, it's like we don't even understand that. We don't even get that right. We don't even, we wouldn't know what a healthy ingredient was if you smacked us in the face with it. We have no clue. And so that's why rice Aroni would come in and go, hey, a healthy thing is just a bag of chemicals you can add to rice. And, and people in San Francisco love it, whatever the fuck that means. And hamburger helper, right? Hey, man, right. do you guys enjoy methylaminomethane and polydimethylaminobenzaldehyde? And oh, Jesus. Yeah. Do you guys want that? No, of course not. What you want is a helper for the hamburger in a packet 
that you just stir in. Don't fucking worry what it's doing to your digestive system for the rest of your life or causing pancreatic cancer. It's Hamburger Helper. It's helping you eat hamburger, which again is going to be an ongoing theme for the rest of the time that you're in that house. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to, you need to pause for a second because I'm still trying to absorb that, that uh, diatribe of the chemical names. Um, that was amazing. I don't even, I can't even call that a pull. That was, that was something not of this earth. You're absolutely right. You know, it was the same, you know, and again, eventually the same reason they took lead out of paint or they took certain things out of food, certain ingredients going, hey, you know, this shit isn't what we thought it was, right? And it wasn't, um, but it was convenient, right? And everybody seemed to be, I guess it be, was it, were people pressed for, were they pressed for time more than we are now? I don't yes. think so. People well, have a hell of a lot more going on now. And to the point by like, here's a TV dinner, here's a frozen pizza, here's rice aroni and hamburger helper. So again, maybe just like everybody's expect it's like, man, those are some low fucking expectations of what you can do in your kitchen. Um, so we're gonna, yes, we're literally gonna help you out. Matter of fact, it's gonna say help in the in the name, so you can just get it. it's like, oh, this is gonna I've got hamburger and nothing else. God forbid I use like a bell pepper and some onions and you know, maybe some right? garlic powder. Yeah. But here you go. It's in a box. Follow the instructions. Feed your kid. Okay. And then get ready to sit down and watch, I don't know, Room 222 or whatever the hell it was. So I think those things that, yeah, it, it's it's staggering to me to look at it. Um, and again, the, the convenience of the food, because I think that was the number one objective, right? It wasn't the nutritional value. It wasn't the flavor. No. Well, the flavor was allegedly the idea, but no. Yeah. Right. It was convenient. I mean, microwaves blew up everything, literally, because of then it became, hey, even the microwave and where you can do these, you can get a little even fancier. Now you even microwave. Ah, oh, screw it. You got to put that in your oven for 45 minutes. You can do this in your microwave in three. Right? Yeah. And so again, it's just like, God damn it. I need that extra, those 42 minutes. That is going to save me. And so I can throw this in the microwave. Here's a, this is, com this is completely not of our generation. We, my grandparents never had, you know, my grandparents married in, you know, the 1930s and, you know, uh, so definitely by the time microwave came, they're married in the 30s, born in like the 19, you know, teens. So by the time microwaves came around, it was, again, it might as well have been the lunar module. But the family pitched in one year to buy the microwave for Christmas and, and my grandmother decided she was going, this is so cool. This is so great. And she was telling you, you can make, you know, you can make grandpa a hot dog. So she, you know, she put it in the microwave and put it and you know, wrapped it in wax paper and cooked it for 20 minutes. Okay. Because, oh, I hope that's enough time. Yes. That hot dog was like a Louisville slugger when it came out of the microwave. It didn't blow up, didn't split. It was a piece of wood. Um, still a legendary story in my family. Because then again, even my grandma's just thinking, oh, I can do this in 20 minutes. You know, great. And this is somebody who made great homemade food. And Sunday was all about fresh sauce and pasta and all that, and maybe eggplant and all these other things. None of which came out of uh, any kind of helper box, right? Yeah, yeah. But I just think looking at those, um, you know, so like I said, everybody was in a freaking hurry. And these were supposed to make everybody's life easier. And that, again, simplicity and speed were really, you know, really the value proposition there as opposed to anything else. And I'm going to make a connection here that maybe this is the first time it ever occurred to me. But I have to believe that one of the reasons that people were in a hurry is entertainment after a long, hard day of work was a big deal. And back then, if you were spending too much time in the kitchen preparing stuff or people didn't get their dinner out of the way, they were going to miss MASH or All in the Family, right? Or Rhoda or whatever. And so there was a schedule. You know, you're back from school. Uh, mom typically is going to make the meal. She needs help to make this as quickly and easily as possible That's so right. that everybody can plop down in front of the TV and make sure that everybody is watching their favorite show at their favorite time with either a hot meal in front of you of some sort, or at the very least, no interruption, right? 
So I, I feel like that played a huge part in it, right? There was some, I, maybe TV execs got together with General Mills. I have no well, idea. they absolutely did. Yeah, right, but it just right. seems like that was the uh, that was the plan, right? Largely. Think, and, think uh, about the yeah. TV tray, which was a, you know, so you put your TV dinner on your TV tray and you eat dinner in front of the TV. Yeah. And man, you are set. You are living the life, right? And again, and you had to watch the show, which you couldn't record, right? Which you couldn't stream the next day, right? right. Which you couldn't just pull up on demand if you, you know, so you had that, that show was on, man, you were going to miss it. You were going to miss it, right? And maybe you could see it again in the summer, but then that's just if you happen to see it in the summer. So no, the, the stakes, no pun intended, were high in the regard. Like, hey, we've got to get, you're right, the speed and the simplicity because we have this, you know, this routine that the modern American family. But let me ask you this, though, because again, the routine, a routine that blew up for me, and this was just a product of the times when I don't know how old I was. I never saw my dad cook anything. Oh, ever. God. Except like on a Sunday. Yes, at the grill, a hamburger, a hot dog, you know, doing, you know, dad, you know, pops is doing the, doing the barbecue. Something happened, I think my mom, because my mom started working and then there was like a working schedule, you know, and this and that. So my dad, and she still got it home in time, but my dad decided I'm going to help out. I'm going to make some food. I'm, I'm going to make a meal. You know, I'm going to cook. And his spam, I mentioned spam, you know, Spam in a cast iron skillet and no flavoring, no seasoning, no side dish. Here's just some kind of grilled and, of course, overcooked and burned and crispy and crunchy spam. Okay. And that was dinner. It's like, thanks, Dad, as I'm trying to feed it to the dog. Um, yeah. He, 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 and then he got the idea of like, you know, the, the paper, the newspaper bag. Is like Thursday would be like the food section and all the ads for the supermarkets. And so he said, well, here's recipes. And again, my, my mom would try to say, you know, cook this, make this, there's that in the cupboard, you know, there's whatever. But now that was because he thought I can do this better. And he didn't say it, but he definitely acted like this. He made this meal for, and I remember this to the day where it was, and he went to the store and bought, made sure he had the ingredients. It was Polish sausage, sauerkraut, and cheese wrapped in a tortilla. Mother of God. And it was like, are you trying to kill me? Are you trying to get me to develop an eating disorder? Yeah. What are, are you trying to make a statement that you're not happy about cooking? So you're going to intentionally, you're going to take a dive. And it was none of those things, right? Because your dad, my dad, and would be like, oh, you're fine. Just eat it. Pipe down. I don't want to hear it. Right. The typical dad stuff, the typical, yeah. turn that music down, get off my lawn, you know, whatever, pick that up kind of thing that we got from our dads back in, in that generation. But it was God it was God awful. I remember this to this day, like it was yesterday, that that was plopped down and I was supposed to eat it. I think I think you uh you really hit the nail on the head there. And by the way, maybe some people listening to this have dads that were the opposite. They actually helped in the kitchen. They were actually supportive of their wife coming home and being tired or not having time to do that. And maybe they were even good chefs, but not my dad. The worst. Chris, your dad was Julia Childs compared to my dad. My dad would not understand how to cook a meal if his life effing depended on it. He would just, you know, uh, like like cook cook a, a, a steak and burn it and then put peanut butter on it and then, uh, you know, call that a meal and probably just eat it himself. And then you you could get leftovers if you could find some of it. Uh, so anyway, yeah, to say that he was not good in the kitchen is an understatement. But um, back back in the day, that was pretty common, right? Is that just nobody nobody was going to help out your your poor mom? By and large, was the only person that was going to be able to accomplish that task for for the entire family. But the best part of your story, Chris, is the fact that your dad decided that Polish sausage and the cheese, by the way, which rarely go together, sauerkraut. And sauerkraut, sauerkraut and cheese. Wrapped in a tortilla. I don't know if this was a We Are the World kind of like rainbow coalition sort of, because they, they, they are origins of those food. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing I was going to say is it's the, 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 the icing on the cake really is the tortilla. The fact that he thought a tortilla 
would be, or or the recipe thought a tortilla. The by the way, right. g- please tell me that that recipe was not written by another dad. It clearly was. There was some other dad that wrote that recipe. I have no. It was in the newspaper. It was published. It was probably the editor of the fucking newspaper that wrote it, and and of course that had to be a guy because women weren't allowed to have that lofty of a position, right? Where they're actually, you know, making sure that the news is presented properly. God forbid a woman should be able to do that, right? So um, anyway, going back to the tortilla, um, the abomination of our version of what Mexican food is back in the 70s and 80s, to this day, it's almost a war crime. Because back in the day, especially here in Southern California, when we had you know, very close access to the most amazing food on the planet. Our version of that, that played out in supermarkets and on television and in fast food chains was just horrific for the longest time. To this day, all we have, right, as a remembrance of that horrible time is Taco Bell, which by the way, don't get me wrong, I love Taco Bell, but that is not Mexican food. Please don't ever make that mistake, right? That is silly to make that by the way in mexico you're going to have a hard time finding an enchirito gordita right i don't think they you know did they invent gorditas in 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 south america uh mexico or even in spain no sir the gordita does not exist right that is an imaginary word may as well have been in a dr seuss book my point being is that thank god right eventually at least here in southern california we started getting authentic Mexican restaurants and fast food chains like Alberto's and Roberto's and all these different offshoots Alberto's, of the Berto family. Yeah. yeah. Um, where this is what you want in a burrito, carne asada and fresh shrimp. And don't even start me on rolled tacos and don't even start me on machaca. And, and our, the famous uh, item down here, the flying saucer, which is just this crispy tortilla with all these beautiful fresh ingredients on it, you know, served up lightning fast for back in the day, under five bucks. And that is authentic Mexican food. But our version of it, God bless my mom, God bless her heart, her version of it was just not, not good, to put it that, to put it bluntly. She made these things called sour cream burritos. Don't get me wrong. You could eat them. They were, they were, you know, okay tasting, but it was, the same thing, right? It wasn't the same kind of meat. It certainly wasn't um, marinated or flavored correctly. It was in a tortilla shell that was usually overcooked and a bit dry um, and then glopped with sour cream with basically no spices or seasoning. And we're like, hey, man, beef in a tortilla with sour cream. Yay. And then later we would learn, oh, wait, that's that's really it's really not Mexican food at all. That, that's just a loose interpretation, you know. Well, first off, all excellent points. Um, shout out back to the roll taco, uh, as opposed to calling it taquito, which I, I argue to people to this day saying, no, it's a roll taco. It's not a taquito. Okay. Yeah. And that's sort of, that's one of the things that sort of just shifted and was Americanized. And now I think people do refer to it, but we, no, it was a roll taco. Give me five roll tacos with sour cream and, and guacamole and cheese. Um, Taco Bell was actually, f- did you know that that was actually founded by a guy named Gene Bell? That's a na- that's the guy's name. It wasn't had to do, so then they had the Bell as their, as like their logo with like a little, and then also, if you remember the original with like this guy, it would like a sarape and a big sombrero, like taking a siesta because that's what they do because they're lazy and they sleep and then they get up and they eat, right? All, all of the stereotypes and then to even call it Taco Bell. Right, because it was founded by a guy named I think Gene or Glenn or something. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, but and you're right, and Taco Bell has its place. If uh, first of all, if you're if it's the middle of the night, if you're in an airport and you're on a way to catch a flight, perfectly acceptable, right? If you're in the middle, uh, if you're in middle of nowhere, and that's it's it's either Taco Bell. Or I don't know, maybe some other something else that's you know another option. Burger King. I'm going to go Taco Bell every day, every day of the week, right? If that's I'm traveling on the road. Or um, again, I was like shuttling my daughter back and forth to the, my various sort of parental obligations because she can't drive herself, 
And in the middle of the two, it's like, yeah, you got to eat. You're hungry. There's Taco Bell. We're going to hit that drive through. It's cheap and it's fast and it's actually not bad. Was it? It's not your first choice. It's not sitting at home going, you want Mexican food? Yeah, let's go to Taco Bell to your point. You're not, yeah. but for the circumstance, it's, it's, it works. Okay. But yeah. I think that, but see, I was fortunate enough despite, um, despite my dad's attempts at, you know, sour, sauerkraut and Polish sausage and, and, uh, and spam. There was another one that involved. Don't forget, wrap it in a tortilla, Chris. Right. And there's another one that I will just let that was involved, uh, ham, uh, cream cheese and pickles. And I'm just going to let it go with that one because I don't even want to get into the detail. All of those I like, ham, cream cheese, and pickles, not together. But that's another, again, that's another anecdote. I didn't have time for that one in the sense. But I was fortunate enough because, again, along with the, with, the, with the convenience of all this stuff is then you also had your SpaghettiOs, right? And your Chef Boyardee and all that stuff. Yeah. And, the, and deviled ham, wasn't there also, there was the deviled ham, another mm-hmm. one that was like, on a shelf, and it was prepared some sort. And it was kind of like a brat, or not a brat, where it's like a liverwurst or something, right? Um, but like I was fortunate, of being half Italian, we couldn't eat spaghettios. Were banned from my house. We didn't eat sauce out of a. Jar. I was fortunate in that regard. It's like you're not. I didn't eat sauce out of a jar until I like had to buy it on my own when I needed when I wanted to make pasta myself when I was like 20 years old. And I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, I'm li- I don't have any sauce my mom's not going to make me dinner so but those all of those things that and again and i almost wore that as a badge of honor it's like yeah although i wanted to try it it's like i've never had spaghettios you know yeah try those spaghettios which are freaking god awful yeah right but um those they are they are i would say they are deliciously the worst but when i say deliciously i just mean chris i was kind of weaned on those things for years i would eat spaghettios and chef boyardee and the little raviolios and all that uh and mm-hmm. there's something comforting about the chemicals and that sauce that if you weren't born and re- bred on it then uh you may not know but you, whatever chemical combination is in those there is a comfort to it you know uh but it is god awful yeah it is not meant for human consumption typically um any more any more than mcdonald's is yeah Yes, I mean, still deal with stuff that is mass produced, but I think there's just a little bit more care and a little more, um, I don't know, in the sense of a little more preparation. And I don't know, it, there's, it's just different. Thank God. But we're alive, right? Well, we are. Um, and I, I would say largely, Chris, the reason you and I are still alive is that we're largely preserved. <laughs> uh, certainly, um, I can add an extra three years to my life just based on whatever chemicals were in booberry cereal i think that alone probably in peanut butter captain crunch that probably alone will keep me if nothing else embalmed when they when i do finally pass away but um so did you, you did you have cereal freedom then because my cereal intake was pretty normal but it was regulated as all hell like i wanted to try i wanted fruit loops and i wanted captain crunch and all of those things but no i had to have no the sugar i had to, if i wanted sugar on my cereal i had to add it to my on the sly right i, I had, I had uh i had two parents that would work mostly full-time and i was also mm-hmm. the the kid that came along late in life like i mentioned right my, my siblings are 13 and 16 years older so established luck, lucky for me i was largely left to my own devices and so i had a pretty good selection there my mom would typically let me go with her to the grocery store and choose the things that i wanted and what I wanted was always the worst, right? Peanut, anything with artificial peanut flavoring was usually my first go-to. Peanut butter mm-hmm. Captain Crunch to this day is my favorite cereal flavor of all time. And um, the other thing that I love that was peanut flavored uh, on that topic would be uh, space food sticks, right? Because we all we all were going to have a vision of the future and everything was going to be very different. I think we're going to be touching on this in a future episode, right? Which is, by the way, pardon the pun. But I think we're going to be talking about the vision of the future later. But space food sticks, you know, this is what the astronauts ate. And it's basically just a, a really sugary, soft Tootsie Roll. And I guess that's what the astronauts used. I it, it, Presumably, mm-hmm. it's something that you squirt out of a toothpaste tube and you would eat it or something, right? But, man, a peanut butter space food stick, oh, I was in heaven. And the other thing was, for a limited amount of time in stores, uh, Chris, you could get novelty peanut butter. 
I think, uh, mm-hmm. do you remember the novelty peanut butter? I remember one, I and I want, it's ironically enough, I want to say it was called like Google or Googly, where it was like flavored peanut butter, which when you think about it, but but peanut is the flavor, but at the same time, you know, it's like when it's, yes, I remember that. And I also remember one that was like peanut butter and jelly in the same jar. Yeah. Right. So they're, and I don't even know, goober, I don't even. I, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going sure. to help you out on that. You're so close. It was goober. G-O-O-E-E-R. Goobers. Yes. Okay. And uh, goobers, goobers peanut butter was peanut butter and jelly. Uh, in the same jar, already mixed together for you, and it, and it was it displayed as stripes of jelly when you looked at that jar. Right, and, right, yeah. And then you had uh, uh, Kraft came out with types of peanut butter that was chocolate flavored peanut butter, banana uh-huh. flavored peanut butter, peanut butter that tasted more like caramel or whatever it was. But um, anyway, I can't even imagine there's you know many chemicals in that at all. But uh, I'm just so addicted to peanut butter. Yeah. It it all it was all the same philosophy, right? It was cutting out the middleman and saving you thirty seconds by I don't want to have to have a jar of peanut butter and a jar of jelly, yeah, right, and have to first mix the t- no, I can just do it all in one knife, right, with one jar, and boom, I'm done. The flavored peanut butter again, peanuts is the flavor. It's like those flavored coffees. It's like no, I don't. I just want coffee. Coffee is the flavor, okay. I don't need, so those, and again, much like they had, and it was all the powdery stuff, getting back to your future-ish kind of thing. When we talk about, there was instant coffee like Senka, there was Tang. And I don't know if oh, we yeah. mentioned Tang, because yeah. we'll talk about it soon, because that was the, they, they pitched that as like, this is what the astronauts drink. It's like, mm-hmm. no, it, 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 no, not Tang, it's, but somehow, you know, because it goes like an orange powder full of probably those same chemicals you rattled off. You yeah. put that in a in a you know in a glass with what you mix it with water, and there you go. It's probably not even ten percent. It was probably zero percent juice. It wasn't even ten percent juice. I'm not saying we were experts on nutrition and health back in the '60s, but I'm going to uh, guess that the nutritionists that were part of the NASA you know Tiger team uh, working on the Apollo mission did not think that orange flavored sugar was going to be a good thing to give to the astronauts when they're out there in space. Probably had more nutrient value and electrolytes and stuff in the original version of it that the astronauts got. But the the version I got sure tasted fucking good, I'll tell you that. But I think, Chris, we can, we can basically say, in general, right, the food tasted pretty damn good. It wasn't healthy. We didn't even know how to make healthy food for the most part. There was a vibe in the 70s and 60s of organic, doing your own thing, being a hippie, but it was going to be a big life choice to be able to do that. It wasn't made easy by places like Trader Joe's or Sprouts, right? You didn't have places like that to go to. And largely, as we talked about, it really just had to do with, I don't have a lot of time. I just came home and guess what? We got to watch Barnaby Jones, right? Or Barney Miller or name another Barney. Barney. No, I don't know. Barney Rubble. That's three Barneys. I don't know. Or Barney right. Rubble. There you go. Why am I? Why did I just come up with four Barneys? I have no idea. But uh, Barney Fife. Oh my God! I'm on a roll. I can't oh, stop. Good. Give me Keep another going. Barney. Holy moly! Oh, that's a God, lot of Barneys. I don't know. Uh, uh, that's a, that's but, I'm out of Barney. But there we go. It was an innocent time. Uh, thank God, food has definitely improved. Health has definitely improved. And uh, and there you go. Um, and and Chris, I'll leave you with this thought which was the exact same thought I had going back to the beginning of this episode when I saw that photo of my grandma's open house. What did I see off in the distance, Chris? I saw that little bowl of hard candy that would be right there at the door, right? As people walked in, grab a hard candy. And Chris, I want to leave this episode with you telling me what happened when you grabbed one of those hard candies out of that bowl and lifted it up. It was generally stuck. Right to the other candies. That's right. Yes, exactly. And the bowl, you know, right. So you couldn't grab just one. Um, and 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 to that point, which makes is like, okay, how long have these candies been here? Number one. Um, number two. Um, what flavor did you want? There was nothing even remotely like I'm going to dig through this. You know, this is some sort of gesture by my grandparent 
So it's like it's a candy. It's a it's a rock hard Brock's candy. I think was the leader in that oh, regard, and there was gross. nothing. No, it wasn't a jolly. You know, these were not Jolly Ranchers. These were not now and no. later. Right? These were nothing of those. Or these were not Milk Duds or Rolos. Rolos. Oh my God, that's thirty thousand points right there. Right, or even Hershey's Kisses, which would be worth your time. So I'm going to grab this dish, and the dish itself would come up almost sometimes with that hunk of rocks. It would. And I'm going to, and I'm going to maybe pick off one, and then maybe I'm going to pretend to eat it. And but at the same time, maybe it was all calculated. Maybe that was the idea. As they're trying, it was sort of like an anti-smoking campaign. It yeah. was an anti-candy campaign. Hey, I've got candy. Try some rocks. And yeah. but we knew better. Thank God we knew better. And again, we're here. We survived the Brocks. Again, probably mm -hmm. stuck it in my pocket, probably. Or if I managed to unwrap, you couldn't even unwrap it, right? Because it was so stuck together. It's like I'm eventually I'm going to have to stick this thing in, the, in my mouth with half of the cellophane on it, right? Because it was everything was stuck together. And um, you pretend to eat it. And then the first chance you got, um, it was in the trash or in a bush or if you were really desperate. Because I did this once, and and it was in my pocket, and then in the the tough skins got in the wash, and and it was a mess. But you wouldn't eat it; you sure as no. hell wouldn't eat it. And but maybe that was the idea. Occasionally, I would get so desperate, and I would eat one. And you're talking about ones that were wrapped. I mean, the ones that weren't even wrapped, and everyone put their grubby fingers on it, mm -hmm. and that's totally disgusting. And by the way, right. the worst flavor of all. And uh, I would like to leave this image in everyone's mind, and maybe you can all relate to this as the last part of this episode, which is the purple Brax hard candy. And mm -hmm. if you mother effing dared to put that thing in your mouth, you just got a mouthful of perfume. That's the only way I could explain it. Have I ever sprayed perfume in my own mouth? No. But if I had, that's exactly what it would have tasted like. There has never on the planet Earth been a more artificial flavor than a purple Brax hard candy I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. The end. Good God, Jeff. I don't, I can't top that. All right, Chris. Until next time. Till next time, Jeff. Till